Hello, everybody. I'm Jamie Wolf. I'm here at Pine Ridge Baptist, and um, I am going to continue my scripture reading. I'm going to read the second part of um, chapter 13 in Matthew, and I'm using the uh, New Living Translation. I just hope everybody's doing well, and I hope this will bless everybody and um, you encourage them. Um, I just want to pray just real quickly. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day, and thank you for being, us being able to use this technology you have. And I just hope what we that we're doing will reach the world and open their hearts and minds up to what we're saying, and our message will reach lost people and the people who just need Jesus. Who sometimes people just don't understand they need them, and some people are just in a gray area in life and don't know that they need Jesus, and He would make their life so much better. He would. Um, Bless them and guide them and direct them to the ways of the righteousness. And I also, also want to pray for everyone who's on the prayer list. Our weekly prayer list here at Pine Ridge gets longer and longer. And I want to specifically pray for Brother Red and Miss Juanita. We're, we're praying for you, Brother, and we just we love you and we adore you, and we hope you have a speedy recovery. And we want to pray for Pastor James that he he's doing he will do well through his surgery and. You minister to everybody who needs you, Father, and you just uh, just be with him, Father, and let him know you're, you're, you love him and just minister to him all you can. And we just ask that you remove the pain from him and take his mind off of it and let him come back to church and glory, give you all the glory for his healing. We love you again. We adore you in your son's precious name. We pray. Today I'm reading the second part, as I said, of the Matthew um, chapter 13. It was, there's so much I wanted to um, stop because there was a lot of information in it. And I want to give a brief um, overview of the um, chapter. Um, I'm going to start with the parable of, of the yeast. Jesus also used this illustration. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. Jesus always liked, oh, Jesus, always, Jesus always used stories and illustrations like this when speaking to the crowds. In fact, he never spoke to them without using such parables. This fulfilled what God has spoken through the prophet. I will speak to you in parables. I will explain, explain things hidden since the creation of the world. This is a parable of the wheat and the weeds explained. Then, leaving the crowds outside, Jesus went into the house. His disciples said, please explain this to us, the story of the weeds in the field. Jesus replied, the son of man is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world and the seed and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. If the enemy planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the harvesters are their angels. Just as weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be the end of the world. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all, and all who do evil. And the angels will come throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their Father's kingdom. Anyone that hears to hear, anyone that hears to hear should listen and understand. The parables of the hidden treasure and the pearl. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. This parable of fishing net. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown in the water and caught fish of every kind. When the, when the net was full, they dragged it up and into the shore, sat down and sorted out the good fish in the crates, but threw the bad ones away. That is the way it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous, throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace, where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you understand all these things? Yes, they say, we do. Then he added, Every teacher of religious law who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like a homeowner who brings from a storeroom new gems of truth as well as old. Jesus rejected Nazareth. When Jesus had finished telling his stories and illustrations, he left that part of the country. 
He returned to Nazareth, his hometown, when he taught there in the synagogue. Everyone was amazed and said, where did he get this wisdom and the power to do miracles? They, then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter's son. And when he knew Mary, his mother, and his brother, James, Joseph, Simon, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, all his sisters lived right here among us. Where did he learn all these things? And they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, A prophet is honored everywhere except in his home, own, hometown, among his own family. And so he only did a few miracles there because of their unbelief. And that's the ch end of chapter 13. Um, and like I said, there was so much information that I wanted to just do it in two parts because I don't want to spend too much time and get kind of drawn out. But um, I just wanted to do a, a quick summary. I had written a lot of stuff down and I let my printer ran out of ink. So I'll just I'll do the best I can with what I had. Um, I got two good points I want to just mention. that um, In the beginning of the chapter, Jesus is talking to the crowds about what type of people they're, they're going to encounter in their life. And especially when they go out and try to witness the people. There, there are some settlement types. He explains them. He, he uses illustrations of them being like types of soil, like the wayside. The wayside soil is like a person who hears the word and scoffs at it and doesn't want anything to do with it and it continues on their way. Who's to say maybe later in life they get saved? We just don't know. But we all know those are the kind of people we just let go on their way and let God handle them because he will in their own time. And in his own time, I mean. But um, <clears throat> as long as you're planting a seed, that's what matters. Okay? And uh, <clears throat> and then there's um, there's no telling why they're like this. I might be, they might get discouraged. Maybe somebody in church said something negative about it, and they just don't want anything to do with it. And another room type is the um, stony ground. The stony ground is like, I guess, kind of like a mountainside or somewhere that's rocky. You've got very little soil on it. And the seeds, they might sprout, but they won't do very well. At first, they'll do great. They'll look beautiful. And everything is, looks really good to a person that's like this. And all of a sudden, they get, they get turned off from it. There might be, might be something as simple like they went up to the front of the altar with their friends. Maybe they did it because they were just being part of the crowd. Maybe they didn't know exactly what salvation means. And personally, I think, and somebody is truly saved, I think the deacons, the pastor, or even the elders in the church should make some kind of contact with this person on a regular basis just to see if they understand what they've done in the life-changing event they've, um, they've um, taken place. They can, they can grow in the church because a lot, and not, a lot of times they'll just, they'll come and, observe and just say, oh, well, this isn't for me, and they'll go on their way. And we just don't know. I mean, we just have to, you just have to deal with them. And, but making contact and um, fulfill, not fulfilling, but uh, just keeping in contact with them makes all the difference in the world. It makes them feel welcome, makes them encouraged. Because I know quite a few people who've come to church, not not this particular church, but other churches are newcomers, and um, they come in and they say, well, I came in and nobody shook my hand. Nobody spoke to me at the end of the day when we're leaving, in which they have a point. But I think when you're leaving and you're a newcomer, you should go out of your way and be assertive and, and introduce yourself to people. And that's how you get friendships to start and develop. And especially with Christianity, brothers, we, you know how important fellowship is it's because we have to stick together because of the way the world is now. It's It's going down the drain pretty quick, but we have to stay together and put all our differences behind us and, you know, our squabbles in the church or, or petty differences. And let's focus on the real things because if we start doing that, we're going to keep, we're going to go back. And it's one thing that causes churches to close. I truly believe that. Then you have the type of soil that's, th that's a thorny soil. It, it's, it flourishes and do real good, but it's sometimes the weeds will choke out the good crop you have in there. This is describing a person who who's on fire for God for months, years, no telling how long, and all of a sudden something will get in their way. Maybe their own personal agenda. Maybe they have a business meeting with a Fortune 500 company. Though we can't go to church this weekend, we can't do this function. 
And it, it starts, it's a downhill spiral. I mean, you start missing church all the time and you'll make, a, you'll make excuses up not to come. Believe me, I know this for a fact. Well, those kind of people are not lost or they're saved. They just don't, they don't really grow and the growth is hindered by their lack of participation and fellowship and um, their um, constant communication with the Lord and their personal relationship with Jesus. Because without that, you know, we have nothing. We're just sitting in the pews. Um, you might as well be sitting there twirling our thumbs if we don't have that personal relationship and personal contact with him. You know, and, and, and your, private, your private times are very important. I'm, I'm a full, a true believer of this. You have to block out everything and just sit there and listen to him when he says to you sometimes. But people who are in the thorns, they just they find other reasons in not to come. And sometimes they'll pull other people away from them away from the church and doing good things. Um, another um, one is the good ground. That's self-explanatory. Seeds are planted on a good ground. That means the, the plants are doing well, the seeds will sprout, and they, they heard the word and they receive it and they understand it and they understand it and acknowledge it. And they, they um, produce good fruit. I'm not saying these other people and these other types of soil that Jesus illustrates or bad people, it's just they don't, maybe God just hasn't reached out to them, maybe he just hasn't drawn them, maybe it just isn't their time. We just don't know because, you know, when God wants us, he draws us to him. We know that for a fact. You know, maybe he's just getting their interest. Maybe he's waking them up, and maybe their, um, maybe their um, relationship will develop later in life. We just don't know, and we can't say one way or another if that's true or not. I mean, it's, it's all about the personal relationship and free choice. And another thing he was talking about in chapter 13, he goes on these three parables I was reading in um, EnduringWord.com. It explained a parable of the wheat and weeds, the parable of the mustard seed, and the parable of yeast as corruption, as corruption in churches. Um, you know, there's some um, like in the wheat and weeds, there might be people in a church trying to do good, making program, getting programs started, maybe even having programs going already and getting it that's growing and you have somebody step out from behind the shadow and um, um, have a opposition to it and find reasons to stop it i know this happens a lot not and, and you know it's happened in several places i know of and that kind of thing can destroy a church pretty quick i think and, and everybody's um not only in a church is able to get involved in corruption we as well Corruption, anybody can be corrupt. Corruption will destroy our personal lives as well as our relationship with Jesus. Money or anything like that, our personal choices, you know. Our personal choices are, are important, and God wants us to make the right ones, and he will guide us and direct us, but we, but we have to give him the chance to do it. We have to give him the opportunity to do it. I know I made bad choices in my full life more than once, many, many times, and he's been there to straighten me out. I mean, as far as conviction goes, um, I've been coming to conviction more than, than times than I can count, than count. It's because of my own personal choices. But the whole thing is I repent and, and he does forgive me. And I know when I'm forgiven. Like Brother Jerry's mentioned the other day, he felt the spirit left him one time when he was having an argument with his wife. And I, I truly believe it. And you can feel it when, when spirit leaves you, you know it. It's... It's a bad feeling. I just it, it'll make you miserable. But if you repent, he will come back to you. He will restore you, and he will bring you back to him. I'm a true believer in that. But um, I want to speak about the parable of the yeast. Um, the kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used to make in bread. Even though she only put a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of dough. <clears throat> Think about this. Think about just a little bit of sin in the church. Just think about how far that can go. It can, it's another thing to take a church down, cause it to close, cause it to split, cause hard feelings. And that's the last thing we need because sometimes the feelings can't be re restored. I mean, even God forgives us. That personal relationship may not ever be the same if we hurt each other's feelings in the church. And if there is sin in the church, God will expose it. I know that for a fact. And um, he will deal with it in his own time, in his own way. 
And the third thing I really noticed that jumped out at me was he's telling the um, crowds, excuse me just for a second. He's telling the crowds what's going to happen in the end days. He's telling them not to worry because he's going to sort all the bad people out from the good people. He's going to, he's going to, he's going to like you're saying, he's going to let us live together and we all just have to right now. But we still have to witness to them no matter who they are. <clears throat> but he's telling them he's going to, the enemy plants the weeds. He puts his, the enemies in our way sometimes. There's another one who op opposes and criticize the church, criticize Christianity. If you watch the news and you listen to some of these so-called journalists and listen to them really talk, you'll understand that things have taken a turn down to the downside because um, they're, they're, they're taking people with them who don't know anything about religion, don't know about Jesus. And that's the thing. You can't talk to people about religion. You have to talk to them about their personal relationship with Jesus. Because you can cause a con conflict when you talk about religion. But if you ask them about their personal relationship with Jesus, that kind of start, uh, start up a whole new, whole new conversation. But he's telling the crowds what is going to happen. And, and um, the ones who are in his kingdom, the ones that are saved, they're going to be spared from it. And he's going to come to the rapture of the church and take his bride. And some are going to be left here. And I feel I'm pity for them. It clearly says here in um, Matthew 13, 41 uh, and 41, Matthew 13, 41. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them to the fiery furnace where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. So I just hope people who do hear the messages, even if it's online, it reaches you and it opens your hearts up. Because there's going to come a day where this is not going to be an opportunity for you. I was saved and I don't, and back in 2001, and I don't have any doubts about my salvation, but I went through periods of my life where I didn't grow and I was actually running from God until he basically got my attention. And he told me he had me things for he wanted me to do and because I wasn't doing anything with my life. And he wanted to um, make sure he wanted me to use, he wanted to use me. And I don't, I didn't ask him where. I just said, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll follow you. And where you asked me to. But he's telling them what's going to happen in the end times. And um, there, there's no doubt about it, what's going to happen. And the only other thing I want to say, when Jesus is rejected in Nazareth, you know, he clearly says, a prophet is honored even where in a in his hometown and among his own family. And that's obvious as just as anything is the sky is. The, blue is, is. the sky is blue, it's obvious. It's not just because of the people in our neighborhood around the church. It's, it's people in our, our towns, in our, in our world, in our state, in our nation. Nobody wants to hear it, the God's... Um, message anymore. It doesn't seem to be. But it just doesn't change the fact that we still have to witness and still have to be servants of God and follow Him without any hesitation and without any thinking. Because he, he'll, guide, he'll guide us and direct us through this. But um, I just hope everybody enjoys me, my reading, my scriptures. I'm actually growing in it myself. As I'm, like I said, I was going back and using Enduring Word and it's helped me understand what I'm reading. And that's one reason I want to share it with you. Um, and I just hope it blesses you because it sure is a blessing for me. Um, I just, and I want to thank Jerry for doing everything he does. And um, we still want people to come join us. Maybe you can add, help add to it. We can grow from this, all of us. But next time I will do, I'm going to read, it's going to be chapter 14. And, and um, it's a relatively short chapter, but there's, it's pretty powerful. There's a few things in there that really jump out at me. Especially when Peter goes and, and walks on the water to meet Jesus. I mean, I was um, just came started coming to church, and we were came to church on Wednesday night, and Brother Red asked us to pick out scripture out, which meant the most to us. And I was just flipping through the Bible, sitting there sweating because I didn't hadn't read a page in it. I don't think before that time, a point in my life, and I was sitting there sweating trying to figure something out. They're gonna call on me, and I started reading through this, and this just jumped out at me. Peter is walking through or walking on the water to Jesus. And as long as he's walking 
kept his eyes on Jesus and kept his focus, he was able to do it. And once he, he um, took his eyes off of Jesus, he sunk. And that's just like us. And you know, everybody who knows anything, everybody who knows anything about what I'm saying knows it's true. But anyway, that's next time. I just want to say a thank you. I love you. And I pray for you all the time. And I will see y'all next time. I love you and adore every one of y'all. Goodbye.